This is the fourth lecture of MA 1012. In this lecture, we'll think about de Moivre's theorem, about how to understand the roots of um, the simple polynomial equation uh, z to the n equals constant. We said previously that we could write um, our complex numbers x plus i y in a polar form as r times cos theta plus i sine theta, where r is the modulus and theta is the argument. Um, so this uh, expression, though, also came up in our study of the exponential function. So we could actually write it in a more convenient format, at least using fewer symbols, as the exponential of something. When we took the exponential of an imaginary uh, part, the exponential of i times y, we got cos y plus i sine y. So this will be, uh, from our study of the exponential function, just exactly this nice little expression here. And that we'll use a lot. We'll package up angles into this sort of exponential i times angle over and over again. So uh, because, partly because it gets rid of having to ever talk about cosine or sine, uh, you get rid of all that trigonometry in some sense. So it's a convenient way to rewrite it. And if we plug that in here, we get that every complex number can be written either in its rectangular coordinates as x plus i y, or in this very neat little package as its polar coordinates, r e to the i theta, the, the modulus and the argument of the complex number. And we know what happens when we multiply these sort of numbers. It's very easy to understand when you take, say, z squared, you get two r's multiplied together, gives you r squared, and you get two e to the i theta's multiplied together, but the exponentials add there uh, when you multiply them together, so you get e to the two theta. So that's exactly what we said before, that when you multiplied complex numbers, their lengths were adding, and their um, their arguments, their, or their moduli were adding, and their arguments were adding. Sorry, our moduli were multiplying, but their arguments were adding. We can apply that over and over again to very large numbers, let's say some number n of uh, times, and get r to the n. I don't want my r and n to look like each other. Um, e to the i n theta. In other words, if you just multiply this number by itself n times, the lengths, the moduli, multiply n times, and the uh, arguments add n times. Um, but that makes it possible then to so somehow solve the equation zn equals something because you just have to figure out how to get the length to work out and get the argument to work out. In particular, it gives us a rise to a rather uh, trivial trigonometric identity. If we go take this, this thing and go back again, we said that we had a nice way of getting rid of cosines and sines by packaging together into one exponential, which is how we most often want to work with them. Almost never work with cosines and sines directly. Almost always work with this because the algebra is much better. It's much easier to work with. But if you did go back to sines and cosines, you could rewrite this as saying that uh, this e to the i n theta, just forgetting about, about moduli for the moment, just looking at arguments, it's got to be, um, on the one hand, uh, if we expand out that by using this trig identity here, it becomes cos n theta plus i sine n theta. But if we also take into account that this is just n, n fold multiplication of this guy, that's an exponential uh, factor to n times, so um, then that gives us a different identity. That's cos theta plus i sine theta all to the nth power. And this is an enormous collection of trigonometric identities. It says that there's relationships between frequent, high frequency cosines and sines and large numbers of products, large numbers of products of cosines and sines at lower frequencies. Um, so it packages into one package an enormous number of trig identities, which are much more easily remembered as just this, that the exponential of i theta to the nth power is the n exponential of i n thetas. And so it's easy to remember this. It's much harder to remember how to expand all that and what that says when you expand it all out. It becomes very, very complicated. In fact, it makes sense for n not just uh, not just positive n equals 0, 1, 2, and so on, but also for n equals minus 1, minus 2, and so on. You can plug those in and get the same thing, although in this case the n being negative means you're actually taking 
a negative power, which is fine. It's a reciprocal of a positive power. But that gives you also another collection of enormously many trigonometric identities. So I think it's it's fair to say not only that trig that complex numbers are important because they give us solutions of, of polynomial equations. We said by the fundamental theorem of algebra, we could write down the solutions and completely factor all the polynomials in one variable. But it also gives us something else. It makes trigonometry a lot easier because the formulas are a lot easier to remember and involve fewer symbols than if you were to try and write this out for, say, n equals 3 or 4 or 5. It's almost unbelievably complicated, but it's much easier to package in this way. So trigonometry is simplified by complex numbers, too. And as I said before, we're, we're interested in solving very, very simple equations. We want to solve uh, something as simple as z to the n equals, say, some Oh, we've got it in notes the other way around, sorry, uh, so w to the n equals z. Um, so how could we solve uh, for unknown w uh, if we know uh, z? How do we do it? Well, we can plug in that w has to be some uh, modulus and some argument, and z has to be some modulus and some argument. As before, we just plug in exactly as we've had here that um, w to the nth power for any integer n, no matter what the n is. So we know z, let's but we also know uh, the value of n. Um, so we're going to have an unknown w. Everything else is known. Um, this equation just becomes uh, s e to the i unknown phi to the n is r e to the i theta. Um, so we can simplify that by saying this has to be s to the n, e to the i, n phi has to be r, e to the i, theta. And you immediately start thinking, well, that should mean, obviously, that this guy should match with that guy. And it, that's correct, because if you take the absolute values of the, of the complex numbers, you get this bit and this bit. So um, after all, if complex numbers are going to match, then their lengths are going to have to match their moduli. And so we do get correctly that this is correct. Those have to match. These also have to match, therefore, these exponentials. And you might think that maybe that makes n phi equal to theta, but it doesn't quite do that. If two of uh, numbers have the same e to the i, whatever, what does that tell us about them? So how can we understand the solvability of that kind of problem? So we have two numbers. Uh, in this case, it's e to the i n phi, and it has to equal e to the i theta. We're given the theta. We don't know the phi. This is the unknown here. Everything else is known. What are the possibilities? It means, in other words, that if you rotate by an angle of theta, it's the same as if you rotated n times by an angle of phi. And what does that look like? What are the solutions? Well, you could have n phi equal to theta would be perfectly fine. Or you could have n phi uh, equal to theta plus 2 pi. That would also fit in here because we know that if we rotate by 2 pi, it's as if we haven't rotated at all. So this means rotate by this angle, theta. Start with a unit complex number, complex number 1, and rotate it by angle theta. But if you rotate by angle theta plus 2 pi, you get to the same place. So in order to solve this equation, we have to allow the possibility that n phi could be theta, or it could be theta plus 2 pi, or it could be uh, theta plus 4 pi, or dot, 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 dot. So we have all these possibilities, and we still haven't figured out how to get, uh, get the, uh, through them and figure out which ones we actually have to face. But if we draw them, we get, it becomes a bit clearer what's happening. What we're finding is that um, we have uh, these n, uh, n times fees having to be one of these possibilities. Um, so if you write it this way as, let's say, phi is theta over n, that's the same as that. Um, and then this one is the same as phi is uh, theta over n plus 2 pi over n. This one is phi is theta over n plus 4 pi over n. Da, 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 da. But eventually we'll get to phi is theta over n plus, uh, we'll do 2 pi times n minus 1 over n. And then we go to the next one, which is phi is theta over n plus 2 pi n over n, which is 1. 
Um, so if you go through these, well, now you're back to where you started effectively, because the phi itself is only, only the, is, is the argument of a complex number. So it's really only defined up to 2 pi multiples anyway. It really represents the same complex number if you add a 2 pi to it. And so the, po so the possible solutions are these. Um, well, this one is the same as that one, so it's really, the possible solutions are really these. Um, you don't need to include this one because it's the same as that one as a complex number. It represents the same answer, the same complex number. And so the possibilities, if we want to solve the equation, uh, again it was w to the n equals z, we wrote w as s e to the i phi, and z was some known r e to the i theta, these are our unknowns, then um, we can say therefore that s to the n has to be r, so s has to be the nth root of r, and that's the only possibility for the unknown s, and that tells us how long the complex number is. And then the possibilities for the phi are phi is theta over n plus 2 pi over n times an integer, where the integer could be 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 all the way up to n minus 1. And once you hit n, you come back to where you started because it represents the same complex number, w, answer. So a simple example of computing such a thing, if we look at... Um, if we look at uh, the problem of finding um, w cubed equals 1, what are all the solutions? Uh, then, well, the length of w, the modulus, has to be 1 because if the cube is going to have length 1, then it's going to have to have length 1 when you didn't cube it. Um, so, um, after all, length will have to grow as you cube if, it, if it's bigger than 1 and shrink as you cube when it's smaller than 1. So it has to be length 1. Um, but what could the could the argument be? The argument of w, that's our phi, and it has to be uh, equal to, well, let's write this as e to the 0, and it has to be 0 over n plus 2 pi k over n, where k can be 0, 1, 2, uh, to, up to this number here, up to this power, 0, 1, or 2. And then we don't hit 3 because 3 and 0 are the same for our purposes. Once you get up to 2 pi as, your, as, your, as the uh, number you add on here, adding 2 pi is the same as adding nothing to an angle. And so that's our argument of w. So those are the possibilities. So if we write them out, that gives you w is, well, its length is 1, so it's just e to the i phi. Phi is one of these possibilities, so let's write them out. It's 0 plus, well, 0 over n is just 0, so we can drop that term. Um, so it's these guys. It's 2 pi over, oh, sorry, n is 3 here. n is 3. Uh, we're doing third power. So it's 2 pi over 3. Uh, w is e to the i. Uh, 2 pi times 2 over 3. And w is Sorry, it should have been 0. I didn't do 0. W is e to the i 0. Um, w is e to the i 2 pi over 3 and um, 2 pi times 2 over 3, which we can simplify as 4 pi over 3. So those are the three possible numbers that satisfy that their cube is 1. Those are the three possible cube roots of 1 as complex numbers. In, in real numbers, there's only one cube root of 1, and that's this guy. The number 1 is a cube root of 1 because its cube is 1. 1 cubed is 1. But these numbers also have the property that their cubes are 1. If you draw where they sit in the complex plane, this guy is the number 1, and it sits here in the complex plane, 1x and no y's. This guy has an angle 2 pi over 3, so we take all the way around is 2 pi, but we do only a third of it, which is about here maybe. Um, and it should also have length 1. So it has the same length, length 1, and then a third of the way around. Then we go another third of the way around, so maybe somewhere over here. And then, so these angles should be each 2 pi over 3. We get a nice simple picture of those are the different cube roots of 1. Those are the w's, so that w cubed, so w cubed is 1. There's the number 1, and then there's these two complex number solutions that we didn't see when we worked with only real numbers. Before we started working with complex numbers, we only saw real numbers. We knew that there was a real number, a cube root of 1, and there it is. But there are new cube roots that show up, and there they are. In our next lecture, we'll talk about infinite series and the applications of infinite series.